Hi everybody and welcome to this lecture on the naming of plants. For centuries scholars and botanists have made attempts to classify plants in meaningful and scientific ways and you should have read in canvas that most early attempts focused on the edible or medicinal uses of plants. During the first part of this lecture you may think oh she's just going through a bunch of names from centuries ago but the goal of this lecture is to introduce you to some of the botanists whose work extended beyond edible and medicinal plants and contributed to the systems of nomenclature and classification that we use today. What I'd also like you to take away from this lecture is that the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus was not solely responsible for the system of binomial nomenclature that we use today. So let's start with Theophrastus. He was one of the first people we know of to attempt to classify plants in a way that wasn't based on medicinal or edible uses. And he was a Greek scholar. About 2300 years ago, in the fourth century before the current era, Theophrastus classified plants based on their life form and some of their characteristics, such as flower and inflorescence shape. He also distinguished between flowering and non-flowering plants, such as ferns, and recognized sexuality in plants. Amazingly, his work was still being published as a textbook around 2,000 years later, in the mid-1600s. In Europe, from the 15th century onwards, Western European countries such as England, France, Spain, Portugal and Holland began an age of world exploration and, of course, colonialization. Explorers were bringing hundreds of exotic plants back to Europe from the countries they visited, and the need for a consistent, referable system of naming and classifying all of these plants became necessary. So let's take a brief look at some of the people who were influential in developing new plant classification systems in Europe. Let's start in the 16th century with the Italian scholar Andrea Caselpino who was one of the first people who attempted to develop a classification system that wasn't just alphabetical or limited to medicinal plants. Caselpino based his system on his observation of the structure of flowers, fruit and seeds, and published his findings in 1583 in a book called De Plantas Libri. His work influenced the later work of the English botanist John Ray, who you'll hear more about in a minute, and in the video, A Confusion of Names. Caselpino's work was developed further in the late 1500s and early 1600s by the Swiss botanist Gaspar Bohan. He's the first known person to propose the concept of genus for the classification of plants. Genus is the Latin word for birth, race, or kind. And Bohan took this word and defined it as a formal group of plants that all have similar physical characteristics. Bohan's research culminated with the publication in 1623 of his encyclopedia of 6,000 plants classified by, the, by their life form as trees, shrubs, grasses, legumes, and aromatica, which were spices. Around 60 years later, in 1682, the English botanist John Ray published one of the most influential books on plant classification of the 17th century. John Ray is one of the first known botanists to observe and describe the differences between monocots and dicots. He argued that rather than classifying plants according to their life form, you should first classify them as a monocot or dicot, then classify them further using all observable physical characteristics. All of the plant introductions being brought back to Europe needed to be named and described by European scholars. And at that time, Latin was the recognized language of science and scholars in Europe. And plants were described in Latin using a polynomial system. Polynomial just means many names. The way the polynomial system worked was that each organism was first classified into an appropriate genus. Remember that a genus had been defined by the Swiss botanist Caspar Bohan as a group of plants with similar physical characteristics. Having classified a plant in a genus, the main physical characteristics of each plant or animal were then described using a, a phrase. 
the genus name plus that phrase were referred to as the polynomial. Let's look at an, at an example of a polynomial plant name to illustrate this. On the right here, you can see a photo of spearmint. Spearmint was placed in the genus Mentha and then described in Latin as Floribus spicatus foliis oblongus serratus. What this translates as is mentha or mint with flowers arranged in a spike and with oblong sawtoothed leaves. While that's accurate, it's quite a mouthful and a really cumbersome system of nomenclature. Imagine writing that for all of the plants that were known at that time. So with all of these plants arriving in Europe from other countries, it was realized that the polynomial system of naming and describing plants really was too cumbersome and that an easily referable naming and classification system was needed that would enable people to identify an unknown plant. At this point in the history of botanical nomenclature enters the Swedish botanist and professor Carl Linné, later to be better known by his Latinized name of Carolus Linnaeus. Linnaeus is often credited as being the founder of the modern system of nomenclature. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the goals of giving you this very brief history of the naming and classification of plants is also to, to give credit to some of the many other scholars and botanists who were involved in this process. You'll learn more about Linnaeus in a later unit in the video, A Confusion of Names. In the 1750s, Linnaeus set out to classify all plants and animals that were known at that time in Western Europe. As his starting point, he took Gaspar Bohan's genus system and added to that by creating large numbers of new genera. Genera is just the plural of genus. Linnaeus first categorized each plant as a monocot or dicot, then classified similar plants into a genus, then separated them into species based solely on the anatomy of their floral parts. He then replaced the polynomial description of each plant with a single word, and this is referred to as the specific epithet. As an example, on the right you can see a page from Linnaeus's encyclopedia. You can see that he listed the polynomial names for each plant, and as you can see there were, there were often several plants that he considered to be the same, so these were all grouped together. In the margin he then wrote the specific epithet applicable to each of these plants. You can also see that Linnaeus included the native origin of each of these plants. So for example, this, this verbena here is native to Jamaica and the Caribbean. We've got another verbena here that's native to Jamaica. And this verbena diandra is native to Mexico. The culmination of Linnaeus's work was the publication in 1753 of his two volume encyclopedia, Species Plantarum. It included names for 6,000 plant species and is the first known time that a referable system was created using a consistent set of rules for every plant. Linnaeus's system of classifying and naming plants is called the binomial system of nomenclature, and it continues to form the foundation of the naming system for all organisms that's still used worldwide today. Although changes have been made in the way in which organisms are classified, and you'll learn more about that in a later unit. Before I finish this lecture, I want to take a couple of minutes to look more closely at the construction of the Latinized binomial. It's important for you to understand this because you'll be using the binomials throughout the semester and you're expected to learn them for most of the plants on our class list. Let's use the evergreen shrub rosemary, Rosmarinus officinalis, as an example. In its simplest form, the binomial system consists of three main parts, the genus and the specific epithet, and together the genus and specific epithet are referred to as the species. So in our example here, Rosmarinus is the genus and officinalis is the specific epithet. Together, the two words are the species. You may also hear the species referred to as the Latin binomial 
or the Latinized binomial, the botanical name, or the scientific name. These all mean the same thing. Also remember that species is one of those really weird words that are the same in both the singular and plural. So we talk about one species or two, three, four species. There's no change in the pronunciation or the spelling of species. And finally, what's so special about binomial nomenclature and the species name anyway? Well, in contrast to common names, each species name is a unique identifier for a plant, meaning no other plant in the world has that name. There may, there may be many plants in the same genus. There may also be some plants that have the same specific epithet. However, no two plants can have the same genus and the same specific epithet. In this way, the species is a unique identifier for a particular plant and this botanical name is the same whatever country, whatever region you're in in the world. We can still use the common names in everyday speech when we're talking with clients or friends, but the botanical name is what we use in science and professionally when we want to be precise. That's the end of this lecture. Take a break now or head back to Canvas to continue with learning about plant nomenclature and classification.